Yeah, so it's great pleasure to have Rasmus Larsen uh, from the University of Stavanger. And Rasmus has been thinking a lot about instanton ions in finite temperature QCD from the lattice, and he will discuss his latest results and thoughts on this. Rasmus, please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, so this talk will mainly be focusing about what happens to topological objects near TC. So as I had mentioned, I will have some lattice results where we do some comparison. And I will also uh, refer to some other results uh, by Dallas uh, and Edward Churek, which has tried to model what is happening around near TC. So originally, actually, I was planning on an hour talk. So uh, a little bit of my introductory part I might skip over faster. It was, is essentially similar to what you have already heard many times about topological objects. So the difference here will just be that I will also focus a lot on what is instanton dions, which is uh, also what all people call instanton monopoles, which is a generalization, uh, generalization of, uh, the, of instantons. And we will look at why we need these specific objects. Uh, and here I will then afterwards go on and show how does topological, uh, topological objects uh, then look on the lattice? And uh, here we will discuss how do we actually see the topological objects, which in our case is an indirect method where we look at fermionic zero mode around the object instead of the object directly itself. Uh, we will then go on to do a comparison between what uh, we see on the lattice uh, and what uh, we actually get from theory. Uh, and here we're mainly focusing about what is the actual shape of the topological objects which we see. And lastly, we will then also discuss an ensemble of dyons, which uh, uh, tells us uh, about what we are actually expecting to see on the lattice, such that we can see, oh, at this temperature, we're expecting a higher density. And is that actually what we were seeing when we were looking at the, uh, at the lattice? So uh, a comparison between what is expected from the lattice and what is uh, essentially expected from theory. So first off, a little bit of introduction, but I will go a little bit faster through this because we have already heard this many times and otherwise I will not get the entire thing. So from my perspective, the reason why I'm looking at uh, topological objects is not necessarily because I'm really interested in topology. It's because I want to solve an integral which is given as integral over all our Grassmannian variables, psi and psi bar, and some gauge fields A mu. Here I have a minus in front of our action such that uh, I'm essentially already skipped a too complex time. But in reality, of course, if we have some simple examples in real time, uh, we do have uh, that uh, if we want to solve any path integral, for instance, for something like a double world potential, we get a problem when we have multiple minimums because a standard expansion around a mu equal to zero, for instance, will only give you one of the minimums. In principle, you could expand up to high order Taylor expansion, but then you are introducing all the problems due to the Taylor expansion's bad properties. So we want to have a good way of including contributions to a path integral like this from all of the different minimums since they are mostly contributing. It should be, of course, said that in case this uh, uh, difference between the different minimums are too small or too large, then, then this is not really that interesting for different reasons or will not work. So that's also where we will be looking in the region of close to TC, because in this region, we expect a semi-large density of topological objects, not too large and not too small. So as already said many times, topological objects uh, corresponds to real-time transition between different minimums. Uh, but um, the problem is, of course, that if you want to explain things like energy, you have to include all of these uh, transitions because otherwise you're getting the wrong minimum. And standard perturbation theory will not give you this. So therefore, we have to then go on and include all of these uh, minimums which is contributing. Well, uh, what I'm really interested in is to do it all in complex time. And in complex time, um, things are a little bit different. So for instance, the standard instanton can be seen as the minimum where you start at one part of uh, the double world potential, and then you slide down. Uh, and then at positive infinite time, you then reaches the other position, which is a solution to the equation of motion. A little bit funny in this case here, uh, but that can actually be seen as the standard instanton in complex time. So what we want to do though is to do this in QCD. 
So in QCD in complex time, the action is always positive. So instead we can look for a trick, for instance, uh, shown here by Diakonov in his re nice review, where you can show that the action is bounded by the terms of uh, F mu nu minus F mu nu tilde squared, where F mu nu tilde is our typical epsilon contracted with the F mu nu terms. So the reason why this is interesting is because this bound here is minimized when you have that the action is given by a pi squared or g squared times the topological charge. So it shows that we have minimums described by exactly what the topological charge is in QCD. So here, of course, this means that we will have any possible minimum that goes from minus infinity to plus infinity in terms of integers of minus one, zero, one, two, three, and so on. And in order to get a good description of the system, in principle, you have to include everything. But of course, uh, you will always find that there are some minimums which are more important than others, but it's not necessarily the standard minimum you have from perturbation theory. Okay, so a standard uh, way to say, okay, how can we at least try and estimate how uh, much these minimums are contributing is through the semi-classical uh, description. So here you take uh, your solutions to the equation of motion, which is your minimum, and then you expand around that. So you have your topological uh, solution plus a small uh, fluctuation around that. And if you then put that into your path integral, you can see for this specific uh, contribution, if you're expanding only up to like uh, squared terms, you find that you can write it as uh, the classical action of your tabular objects plus the fluctuations described by these uh, AMU fields with a matrix in between. And you can try to integrate out the matrix and you get something uh, uh, in case that you do this. This is a hard plot problem which uh, people have done though. And that is simply given by one over square root of the determinant of, the, of M. This is easier said than done though. The problem though with, with this description is that um, there's certain ways that you can change these minimums where you're not actually changing the action at all. So this is what we often call a zero mode. So, and the problem is that if you have a zero mode, uh, you have an eigenvalue, which is zero. So you divide by zero and it makes no sense. But it's not actually that simple uh, because if you're integrating over something which is not changing, it shouldn't give you an infinity. It should get you the volume which you're integrating in. So therefore we normally subtract the part which has zero mode from this and write it instead of some term, a constant, uh, and a part which have the action in it, which of course can have some top of charge, and then also a volume. So this in, uh, uh, has a contribution of fluctuations, the classical action and the volume which the, uh, your minimum can move around in. This volume here though can be many different things. So it could be your standard four volume, but in case, for instance, that it's rotations, then it could be the volume of rotations, which could be like two pi or higher, depending on which rotations you have. So it's not just a standard volume you have here though. Uh, so in case that we then actually want to find out what is really contributing though to the path integral which we're interested in, in uh, then uh, you have to include all of the different minimums. And in a good uh, semi-classical approximation, if we have it dilute enough, we can say, oh, we can just explain like the two charge solution uh, as just two one charge solutions. So this means that we can write the contribution from each of the minimum as a sum that goes from minus infinity to, into infinity. And then uh, you just have to sum over how many times are you including these contributions. So, so even though these numbers here can be small, in case that you have a volume, which is like your physical volume of your entire space, then this can go so large that you will always have a, a non-zero possibility of having minimums not in your standard a mu equal to zero. And for instance, if you use the Stirling formula, you can, you can use that to show that indeed uh, the typical density of these minimums will indeed be just given by C times the exponential to minus eight pi squared or G squared. So this is really con uh, uh, controlling how many of these topological objects you have in your solution. Also, it should be said this in factorial is because you don't want double count. So, so we have all of these minimums, which are all uh, giving a non-trivial contribution to the path integral, which we're trying to solve. And we of course want to understand then what does these look like and how is these things actually happening? This is very like, uh, this is the simplest case. In reality, you have interactions. So you have corrections to the action from when you have this multiple uh, instantons uh, or instanton lines, as I will talk about uh, interactions. Uh, but, um, but at least we want to understand a bit more about how these things are working because uh, as we will see, this is actually quite important for things like Carl's symmetry breaking. <laughs> 
Also a quick note, uh, we'll not spend too much time in case, of course, you also have fermions, which I kind of uh, didn't talk about so far. Uh, you do also have that you can integrate out your fermionic fields into a determinant of like your Dirac operator plus a mass. And this means that you will actually have, in case that you have any topological objects, you will have zero modes also for the Dirac operator, so fermionic zero modes, which will look like they contribute a lot. But you also have certain measurements like the Carl condensate and, and all inverses of the Dirac operator, which will actually have large contributions from topological objects. So it might look like they will not contribute, but they will actually do to the having certain operators going as one over the eigenvalues. Okay, so the topological solutions are always self-dual and anti-topological solutions are always anti-self-dual given by f mu nu equal to plus or minus f mu nu tilde. I think you have seen that many times already. All I just want to mention extra is here uh, that you can actually uh, get the Carl compensate from the bank cash relation as the eigenvalue distribution at zero of the fermionic uh, Dirac operator. So why is this interesting in terms of topological objects? Well, these uh, topological objects should originally have a, a exact zero mode for the fermionic operator. Uh, but when you have both instantons and anti-instantons, uh, they break these uh, fermionic zero modes. And models, at least, has been shown that this can indeed produce a non-zero distribution of eigenvalues in case you take the infinite volume limit for a zero mass. But as we will see in the end, this is really depending on taking the infinite volume limit. Okay, so as people had already mentioned, you get, a, for instance, a Q equals one solution, which is called the instanton. And all I just want to mention here is that the instanton is indeed actually a very localized object, if you knew, if you knew, uh, uh, so this is essentially the action density is given as a, a size rho to the fourth divided by x squared plus rho squared times to the fourth. So it falls off very strongly as you go outside the size given by rho. So these topological objects are very localized, which we are talking about. So if they're not sitting exactly uh, on top of each other, you will find that they look quite dilute. Uh, but uh, so why do we need then, uh, why is these instantons, uh, which people have been talking about uh, so far, not really that uh, uh, enough? Why are they not enough? Well, the reason is two things. First of all, we are looking at finite temperature me measurements. So we need to have an uh, instanton at finite temperature. This is called the Caloron and can essentially be seen as just an infinite uh, chain, uh, chain of uh, instantons uh, separated by one over temperature because you get temperature in a uh, lattice simulation by making it uh, getting the lattice uh, periodic in one over T in the time direction. But there's one extra thing. We know from lattice simulations that there's a uh, Polikov loop expectation value, uh, which is not always one. But the instanton and Caloran solution will always give you something which is one. So these are not compatible with each other. So we also want a topological object which has a, a Polikov loop expectation value that can be anything. So that then gets us to why we need instanton dions, or more like it's a generalized Caloran solution, but let me explain how these things are related to each other. So if you take the Caloran solution and you generalize it using the ADHM construction, which for instance was done by uh, Kahn and Van Baal in the following paper here, then you can see that in order to get a Polikov loop, uh, which can be any value, you have to introduce uh, free angles uh, in case that you're working with uh, free colors. So this I show on the plot on the right as angle mu1, mu2, and mu3. And your Polikov loop um, will simply be given as uh, exponential to 2 pi i times a diagonal matrix with exactly these values of mu1, mu2, and mu3. So why is this interesting? Well, when you do this, you find that the degrees of freedom which is controlling this generalized uh, Caloran solution is uh, actually different depending on whether you're sitting in this range of a circle, this range of a circle, or this range of a circle. So each of these um, parts of a circle gets uh, three degrees of freedom, which uh, works like a independent uh, free volume degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom is what we call the instanton dynes. So you need three of them to make up a full Caloran with a topological charge of one, but each of these uh, parts will have a part of the topological charge and they will have a part of the full action. Also, there's one extra thing you need to know, and that is that in case you introduce fermions, then you find that um, 
that the boundary conditions of the fermions will control what is happening to the zero modes, because we know that there should be only one zero mode for a topological charge of one. But we now have what looks like three independent degrees of uh, three dimensional uh, degrees of freedom. So where is the uh, zero mode sitting on? Well, if you take anti-periodic boundary conditions corresponding to pi, you'll find that it actually sits on the dian, which degrees of freedom is sitting between mu three and mu two. But if you change the boundary conditions, you can actually get it to move to the other dians. So said in another way, this fermionic zero mode will sit on the, in the range of the circle, which corresponds to a specific dian. So enough about the formula. Let's look a little bit on some pictures. So here I show the density of instant ions in an XY plane. And you can indeed see that uh, you have three independent peaks and you can change the coordinates and they will move closer to each other. You can even move them completely into each other and the action and the topological charge will still stay one. Well, what will change depending on how you change it is that the fraction of these two measurements will be proportional to how large a fraction of a circle that um, the angles mu one and uh, mu two, for instance, encompass. And this we tend to call the holonomy. It will always add up to the full charge of one and eight pi squared over t squared, but how it is distributed will depend on the angles mu one, mu two, and mu three. Okay, so first off, uh, we want to identify then is this actually what we're seeing on the lattice? So how can we do this? So there's two uh, ways that you could do to look for topological objects. The first one is that you could try and measure if, if uh, tilde on the lattice. And in principle, this is nice because then you could see everything there is, but uh, it's not easy to define this on the lattice without having large problems with UV noise. And also, uh, so in order to fix this, people often do cooling, and that actually uh, affects the topological objects when you have instantons and anti-instantons, because then you don't have actually that uh, they are invariant under cooling. So instead, we look for, use the indirect method here, where we look for the fermionic zero modes instead. So this is like uh, looking at uh, an object that forms around the topological object instead of looking at the topological object itself. And the nice thing about this is that you don't need any cooling, but the problem is though that uh, you will, it works best when you have the smallest eigenvalues. As you get up to uh, more and more strong interactions, such that you have larger eigenvalues, you find that the things becomes more and more messy and it's harder to see what you're looking at. So therefore we will mostly be focusing on the zero mode and the near zero modes, which have the smallest eigenvalues. So in order to do this though, uh, we use the OLAP Dirac operator. So, <laughs> uh, and the reason for this is that this operator has exact zero modes, while a lot of other operators, pretty much all of the rest, only has uh, close to, uh, to uh, exact zero modes, or not even close to at all, it should be said. Uh, so the direct uh, operator, OLAP operator, is uh, given as uh, one minus gamma five to the sine function of HW, where HW contains our standard uh, Wilson Dirac operator, but with an extra mass term which has to, to be tuned in order to not get doublers. The nice thing about this uh, is then that you essentially have a lattice, uh, 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 you have a Carl symmetry, but on the lattice, which is given by the Ginsburg Wilson relation. And indeed, in our simulation, we have shown that uh, to a precision of 10 to the minus 9, that this is indeed true. So this is also a very highly non-local operator since you have a sine function. And when you calculate the sine, you have to calculate one over square root of HW, HW dagger, which is non-local. So it's a very uh, computationally expensive operator to use though. This means that we only use it to analyze for the zero modes and not to actually generate configurations. Okay, so before actually showing uh, how some of the topological objects uh, or the zero modes of the topological objects looks on the lattice, let me show, talk a little bit about expectations. So on uh, at low temperatures, we have a Pulikov loop uh, which is, uh, uh, is small. So we expect that the eigenvalues of um, the instance and dying solutions are like uh, uh, zero, one third and two thirds. So they're sitting as far away as possible from each other. Uh, but we also expect the carbon D to be large, such that there should be a lot of dyons and the things can get quite messy. On the other hand, for high temperature, we expect the Pulikov loop close to P1. So we have the eigenvalues, which is like zero, zero, zero. Uh, so this means that the standard Calderon essentially should work and there's no use to use instances on dyons. Uh, but we also expect that the amount of dyons or instantons for that matter is quite low, such that you have a, essentially a dilute uh, instanton gas. <clears throat> 
So for this reason, we have decided to work in between these uh, two regimes, essentially uh, the range of 1 to 1.2 TC, where we expect to see the effects of dions, but not too many, but also not too few. And the configurations which we used here was generated using domain wall fermions, which have close to color symmetry, but not perfect color symmetry. So it's not as good as an uh, overlap operator, but it's still fairly good. Uh, and these configurations has 32 cube uh, times eight size, so 32 in the physical lattice spaces, uh, um, but uh, eight in the time directions. And here we then find uh, the zero modes using the OLAP operator. So after the configuration has been generated, we then find the zero modes using the OLAP operator. And here we find zero modes that appear alone, fermionic zero modes. And we find the um, near zero modes, which appears in pairs as they should, uh, with sizes around 10 to the minus six. And here, when we have been analyzing for the uh, near zero modes, we always look uh, for the free following boundary conditions of the fermions. So it's a half, which is antiperiodic, and one six and five six, which is as far away from each other as possible. So these correspond to what you saw on the circle previously. And this is essentially uh, centered in each of the regions where we expect uh, to have a different dions, where the standard dion, which is antiperiodic, we call that uh, L dion, while the two dions, which should appear uh, in the other regions, we tend to call M1 and M2. But these are just naming schemes. Okay, so let's look at actually some of the zero modes uh, and how they appear on the lattice. And then a little bit later, we will see how they actually compare to some uh, numeric, uh, some analytic formulas. So what we show here is the density in an XY plane of the, the exact zero modes for temperatures of one up to 1.1 CC here. And the red part is antiperiodic fermions. And the two other blue and greens are the ones which you'll be sitting for the M1 and M2 dions. So you can think of these colors as the zero modes of the L, M1, and M2 dions. And what we see is that generally speaking for the zero mode, uh, the position of where the zero modes are sitting for the three types of dions is strongly correlated. It's not always on top of each other. And you also do sometimes find peaks at other positions, but generally for the main peak, they are strongly correlated between the three dions for the zero mode. Uh, generally also you find that uh, for the cases which is not red, uh, which is uh, for the, uh, so not L dions also often have a lot of other peaks all over the lattice. For the near zero modes, uh, we tend to not look at the density, uh, but the chiral density instead. The nice thing about this is that we can uh, then see if we have a topological object or an anti-topological object, because they will appear as plus or minus. So for instance, here we look at 1.1 TC and on the left, we can see it for antiperiodic fermions while on the right, we see it for what should be a M1 dion. And you can indeed see that even though this is the same configuration at the same temperature that uh, for the L dions, we seem to have something which is uh, like a dion anti dion pair. While on the right, we see something which is peaks and valleys all over the place. So this indicate that there is a difference in distribution and it's also probably a difference in density though you can't definitely say that from this. It should be mentioned that this is of course only one out of a distribution of lattice configurations, but this is the general picture which we see at this temperature. Okay, so let's try and compare this to what you actually expect uh, from, um, uh, from uh, analytic formulas. So, so in order to do this, we have done uh, a chi-squared fit with the analytic formula obtained from the AGHM uh, formula. And here we always fit to the densities also because these are gauge invariant. And we assume that the error bars are the same for all the data because we don't actually have any error bars on these uh, zero modes, so they are exact. And we fit with an, uh, uh, not the full uh, uh, lattice, but just uh, the local volume around each of the zero modes, because we do always see all our small peaks uh, since this is actual lattice data. Uh, when we have a charge of uh, QT equal to one, it doesn't mean that there's only one instant on dion. It just means that there's um, maybe the difference between dions and anti dions is one. So there could be 100 dions and 99 anti dions, but we just see one zero mode. But it still means that there can sometimes be a little bit of mixture of all peaks going into the zero mode solution. So we will fit around the dominating peak, but uh, just uh, bear in mind that this is the case. <laughs> 
So the formula which we use, as I said, uh, was obtained from a ADHM uh, method. Uh, here we have a, a, a nice deviation coming from uh, Pierre van Baal, which can be found in the following paper. So in order to find the density, you have to solve uh, for the function f. And here you can really see while, why the diants are living on the circle. So uh, this is an equation on the circle. And the boundary between each of the diants are given by this delta function here. And inside uh, of each of the regions, there's a distance, um, which, which is the separation from the dion to the center. And this uh, changes when you go from one dion to another dion. So you can really see in this formula here where the degrees of freedoms from the different dions are coming from. But anyway, so this uh, can be solved. And if you take the double derivative of this, you get a very long expression, which I will not write down here, uh, but you can get the density. Let me just instead show the main behavior of how the density of these fermionic seal modes around the dions behave like. So even though that uh, the dions, uh, uh, the solution will be sitting around one of the specific dions, depending on the fermionic boundary conditions, you will still find that the shape is depending on what is happening to the other two dions inside the solution. So in case that you have uh, the short range behavior, for instance, uh, around the maximum, that is mostly uh, controlled by the interference between the different dions. So if they are close to each other, you find a strong peak, very localized, while in case that you have them far away from each other, it will go further away, it will be much less localized and you'll find that it also starts to become time independent. So the time dependence is coming from the interference between the different dions. Uh, but still, you, you have one extra information, and that's what is uh, happening with the Pulikov loop. And if you have that, the eigenvalue of the Pulikov loop uh, is quite close to the, uh, to the boundary of the fermion, uh, fermionic boundary conditions, you find that it falls off slow. And if it's further away, you find that the fall off is faster. So you also have an importance in what the expectation value of the Pulikov loop is in how these solutions behave. So we have then fitted uh, on a range of uh, 1 to 1.2 TCs uh, seal modes. And here I just show one of the examples. And what you can see is the blue points are data uh, along the tau directions at the maximum for the full uh, for the full data. So that's at the maximum along the tau direction. And here we have it away from the maximum such that you can see how the behaviors are different around the maximum and away from the maximum. And you can see that a fit with the dyne solution uh, and with a current solution gives a reasonable behavior around the maximum. Both of them have some fluctuations. The current is not quite as well following, but each of them are giving a nice description. But especially around um, the, the fall off, you can see that where the fall off um, is quite different for the Caloran solution compared to the Dian and the, uh, and the data from the lattice. So this shows indeed that you need this extra degrees of freedom of what is the Pulikov loop in order to describe probably what the zero modes of the topological objects you're seeing are. So it's not a huge difference, but you can indeed see that you need instant and dyons and not just standard calorans. Okay, so in order though, to have done this fit, we needed to have fitted a lot of different um, uh, parameters. So you fit the position of the dyons, but you also fit what the Pulikov loop is. So we try to then reverse engineer this and say, okay, what kind of Pulikov loop expectation value does our fit then produce? Uh, so that is the orange and blue the black points, which are two initial different conditions, because we want to be sure that we were in, uh, depending on the uh, initial conditions. And the gray line is what the lattice predicts. So you can indeed see that our fit tends to have something which is quite close to zero, but it does have a, uh, a tendency to go to larger values as you go to higher temperatures. Our largest value though is a bit large, it should be said, but the statistics is very bad on this one because uh, as we saw uh, from the semi-classical approximation, when you go up to higher temperatures, the density strongly drops and therefore you expect something uh, where you don't have as many uh, zero modes and that is indeed what we see. So it's harder to get good statistics at this temperature here. Also, we're a small group, so we don't have that much. Okay. So the other thing what we were fitting in these fits were the, uh, the positions of the dyons in order to create the correct zero mode. And here we uh, found that the, just as you could see in the previous plot, that the M1, uh, M2 and L dyons tends to sit quite close to each other, but it's not always uh, quite on top. So in terms of a lattice spacing, like a, um, uh, you find uh, that it's like one to two lattice spacings, 
or around uh, one third of a femtometer, which is the typical uh, distance between the M and the L dynes inside these fits here. So quite strongly correlated for the zero modes, but not exactly on top of each other, it should be said. Okay, so the last thing which I wanted to put into this uh, uh, talk here is a bit about the ensemble of the dynes because it explained uh, why we're doing this and, um, and why we should expect to see what we're seeing. Sorry. So this means that we go back to, uh, to look for the minimums uh, of, uh, that is contributing to the full path integral. And uh, in this case now, with the dynes compared to the instantons, we no, don't just have a degrees of freedom for each of the instantons, we now have a degree of, of freedom from each of the dynes. So we write this uh, as uh, the same sum as you had before. So the fluctuation contribution, the action contribution, and the volume contribution, and then to a power of how many L dynes, M dynes, or M2, one, M1 dynes or M2 dynes you have. And same thing also with anti dynes. Uh, but now there's a difference though, because the actions uh, is now changing with uh, what the holonomy is. This is how large a fraction of the circle each of the dynes were encompassing. So you can indeed see that what the Pulikov loop is uh, will have an effect on the, uh, how much each of the minimums are contributing to the full um, path integral. But uh, in order to describe the temperature range, which is around TC, though, you cannot just anymore say, oh, things are not interacting anymore. Mm. Uh, so you do have to, into, into, uh, yes, Saiten? Okay, anyway. Uh, anyway. Uh, Sorry, you have seven minutes left, yeah. Uh, uh, eight minutes if we include that Fabian was one minute over time. So, uh, <laughs> So in, anyway, let's see. So, so we want to explain now again, how are these dynes uh, through the minimums uh, contributing to the full path integral and why do we, uh, uh, so why, we should say, why are the dynes then important? Uh, but uh, now there are, there are so many of them around 1.1 uh, TC that essentially you need to have interactions between the different dynes also. So inside the sum, we have to include uh, corrections coming as the change to the action. Uh, it should well be said that typically in these uh, uh, cases here, we assume that the amount of M, L, and uh, M and L dynes are not the same, but that we assume that there's the same amount of dynes and anti dynes because otherwise you get into some other considerations. Okay, so since I don't have too much time, let me just quickly go over this. So we have a uh, interactions though, uh, which is coming from uh, classical corrections because when you have dynes and anti dynes, they have corrections to the actions. The fact that the action is not changing, but it's always a pi squared over t squared is only true if you only have dynes or only anti dynes. Uh, we also find here that we need a core, though well, this should be thought as a model parameter. But the nice thing is that this has to scale with the holonomy. So if you have a, uh, um, so it will, so the core of these dyons in the simulations will depend on what the Pulikov loop expectation value is. Lastly, we also have that the fact that you have introduced a Pulikov loop through a holonomy will create a, a cost of energy. So the potential of this will actually prefer to be deconfined and not be confined. So in order to get confinement at smaller temperatures, you have to overcome a potential like this. Okay, so simulations of this has recently been done um, by Edward Schurig and Dallas Martini. Uh, and um, here they use 120 dyons in a Monte Carlo simulation in order to understand how these interactions uh, between the dyons uh, create uh, corrections to the free energy. And here the free energy is just um, uh, the, the logarithm of your path integral. So once again, so saying that you want the maximum contribution to your path integral is the same as saying you want the free energy with the smallest uh, value. And so here we are looking for a free energy, which is as small as possible in terms of what is the Pulikov loop or the holonomy, what is the density of the L and M dyons, and what is the coupling constant or temperature or the action. These are related to each other. So this was done, as I said, uh, by Dallas and Edward, uh, as you can find in the paper here. So the idea is that you simulate uh, what is the free energy of the dyons uh, uh, at all of these possible configurations, and then you look for which minimum is then dominating. So as you can see uh, on the left here, depending on what the action and of an instanton is, and therefore what the temperature is, you find that different minimums will be dominating. 
So at uh, high temperatures, being green here, you find that it's a minimum away from one third. But as the temperature goes down to the blue one, you find that it shifts into the other minimum here. So in this pure gauge, you will find that there's a jump at some position from one minimum to another minimum, and that will give you a jump in your holonomy and therefore in your Pulikov loop. So it will be smooth in the free energy because when you go from here to here, it has the same free energy. So this means that uh, the dyons can actually give you a reasonably good explanation for what is happening with your Pulikov loop in the pure gauge. Uh, it's coming from the fact that uh, your core scales with what the Pulikov loop uh, expectation value is and therefore has an effect based on that. So what you see is that when you get this jump in the free energy, that indeed it uh, gives, uh, not a jump in free energy, but in the holonomy, you get a change in the, um, the Pulikov loop, which follows quite nicely what you actually see from lattice. Though this is still uh, uh, at the level of modeling, so it's not uh, exactly one to one. In terms of the dyne density, we find that in a pure gauge, we expect that the suddenly when you go above TC, that the amount of L dyons is less and the amount of M dyons is more. And uh, while this is pure gauge, this is kind of why we were also seeing a lot more peaks uh, for the near zero mode uh, uh, solutions uh, for, for the fermionic uh, um, uh, zero modes, as uh, you might remember. So there was a lot more peaks. And the reason for why we expect this is because models like this shows indeed that the amount of M dynes should be more than the L dynes. So um, we also will want to add fermions into this picture here. And the way that this is done is done by expanding the Dirac operator in the contributions of the zero modes. So when this is done, you get essentially uh, the probability of jumping from one dyne to another dyne described by this matrix TIJ. So the simplest thing that can happen is that you jump from one dyne to an antidyne and another dyne also jumps to the closest antidyne. But you can also have cross terms, but you can also have that it starts to jump throughout all of the dyons. And when this starts to happen, it scales, uh, the eigenvalues will scale uh, as uh, the volume. Well, in these cases here, it will scale as the distance between the dyons. So what then happens? Well, first of all, when you include the ferments, you find that the Pulikov loop and the density of the dyons is now smoothly uh, uh, transforming. Essentially, this comes down to the fact that you have broken a centered symmetry by including fermions. So you find uh, that um, the Pulikov loop now is changing as a function of temperature smoothly and going down towards zero to the smaller temperatures in these uh, models of a lot of interacting dyons. You also find that the density of M dyons and L dyons is smoothly going down and the amount of L dyons is always less than M dyons. So this uh, seems to you know, fit with what we indeed we are seeing on the lattice where we always have a lot more peaks for the M dyon regions than for the L dyons. We also uh, uh, can look at the Carl condensate. As quickly mentioned, this had been given, uh, what is given by the density of eigenvalues of the fermionic operator at zero. But you have to take the infinite volume limit. And the way that you do this is that um, you simulate a different amount of particles, so 120, 240, 360, and then you see how the eigenvalue is distributing, uh, changing. And you can see indeed that as you go up to a higher volume, that it kind of extrapolates to a finite value and the gap is exactly going towards zero. So this means that if you have a case like this, you have a finite Carl condensate and a zero gap. And in these simulations, indeed, if the dyne density becomes too weak, you don't get this behavior anymore and the Carl condensate goes to zero and the gap goes to finite. So this is new results uh, by Di Martini and Edward Turek, which just has this out uh, like a couple of weeks ago. So in summary, uh, topological objects represent tunneling between real-time vacuum states, and you need to include all important minimum for uh, precise descriptions. Uh, description. Uh, uh, instant dyons comes from a need to generalize the finite temperature and a Polakov loop, which is different from one. And here you find that the instanton split into NC fractions, uh, which have uh, a part of the degrees of freedom, where each of the de degrees of freedom we call a dyon. And the steel mode uh, shape will depend here on the dyne position and the Pulikov loop. And we see that the lattice steel modes are in good agreement with the dyne description, though there is some fluctuation of around 20% uh, around these uh, uh, solutions. And we see that the Pulikov loop is, seems to be reproduced by the fits we do uh, on this uh, fermionic steel mode, though statistics uh, is still needed, especially at higher temperature. 
Uh, lastly, we also looked at a semi-classical ensemble of dyons in SU3 Don. And here we can see that the amount of density, uh, the dyons, uh, which we have, uh, seems to be changing as a function of temperature as expected. And the dominating minimum is uh, shifting with uh, the smallest free energy, which changes with temperature. And this means that, uh, that what uh, uh, type of minimum is dominating, changes with temperature, and therefore you get a change in the Pulikov loop, which seems to follow what you find at least for the pure gauge. And you also find that the Cal condensate goes to zero as you go above the critical temperature. Uh, so that's all I want to say. Thanks, Rasmus. You finished perfectly in time. We have time for questions. Please go ahead. Antonio? Oh, we have missed that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, yes. Hi, hi Rasmus. Um, hi, hi. Okay. So I explained this many times to Edwards, but uh, he keeps insisting on it. The configuration you refer as dion does not have, is not an eigenstate of the electric charge. It is not sure. correct to call it dion. Well, it is a magnetic charge and topological charge. Oh, yeah, sure. I can still call it dion. No, because there is also real dion in the system, which has mm -hmm. electric charge. If you consider dionic particles on R4, mm -hmm. and when you compactify the space to R3 process one, they have both electric charge and magnetic charge. As you know very well, these two things are related to each other via Poisson duality. Okay, so the configuration at small circle, you know, when you do Poisson resummation, okay, on the di real dionic particles, the sum is over electric charge. The other side of the sum is over, and magnetic charge is fixed on both sides. These configurations you are talking, Say I don't that? disagree. With, I don't disagree with you Very on anything. Good. Very I'm, I'm good. just saying yeah. I'm just uh, I'm just following the naming convention which our group has been done. So if your uh, uh, suggestion is that we should change the naming convention, I'm fine with you. But I don't disagree with you on any Look. of it. I'm just okay. uh, we use the, these Very papers good. here yeah. and they call it dyon. So Look. I just keep calling it dyon. I That's will continue. Just, mm. I will continue. <laughs> so the charge is really magnetic charge, okay, and topological charge, and these objects are standard monopoles. But I mean. Van Bal called monopoles, we called monopoles, and for some reason, you decided to ch change the name, it, 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 maybe Edward and others, and uh, they started I, to call it Dion. It was already in the view papers, which I at least referred yeah. to, so, yeah. so yeah. I don't know yeah, where I started. It. For whatever <laughs> it is worth. <laughs> Van Bal called them constituent monopoles. That's a great name. So then when you talk about ensemble of Dion's, you know, semi-classics of dions. These are very well studied from 2007 to 2012. And in 2012, for example, the phase transition you attribute to Shuryak and De Martini, which exhibits confinement deconfinement, which has contribution from GPY potential, monopole, and bion effect, magnetic bion effect, uh, neutral bion effects, are studied very well in 2012 by Eric Popitz, Thomas Schaefer, and myself, by semi-classical means, by using not ensemble of 100, but whole semi-classics. That means grand canonical ensemble. Mm -hmm. So uh, you are a young person in the field, OK? I think, I think we should stick with one, with the correct names. Second, with, the, with referring the, the right origin of things. I think it's very important. Okay. As far as I remember, your bind, your bind description could be seen as a combination of dyons as far as I remember in instant monopoles. Of course. You want. So, uh, Look. So, 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 so I would be fine with calling everything instant monopoles if that's what you're referring to. Mm -hmm. Instant on monopole is perfect. Okay, but there is other thing I am saying. Now, you refer to the Martini and Shurya for observing a center symmetry changing phase transition and chiral changing phase transition. Look at my 2012 paper with Thomas Schaefer and Eric Popitz, okay? Mm -hmm. You will see the same plot. You will see a genuine calculation. There is a, this, that is really the first analytic calculation of a phase transition on R3 process one. 
You are a young an person. You should... but, 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 but was an analytic uh, formula, uh, analytic calculation, as far as I remember, while this is a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. And there's quite a difference in it. F fine. But somebody showed phase transition on R3 process one analytically. Center symmetry mm -hmm. changing phase transition. This is what well, your Monte Carlo when, is trying when, to let achieve. Me, let me change this. Uh, uh, in terms of this model here, you cannot get um, the transition in a perturbative way. Look. So, the, so if you so if you have the result from perturbation, it means that it will not be. It the is same not perturbation. It is a combination of perturbation theory and non-perturbative things. Yes, but the description which you get here is uh, uh, is uh, from this model. The way that you get it is a non-perturbative effect that comes out look, from the Monte Carlo simulation. We speculated. Look, what we found was a weak coupling phase transition. That is correct, but it is non-perturbative. Okay, and we speculated it goes from it it goes from weak coupling to strong coupling as you change, for example, some parameters. Okay. But we showed analytically this phase transition, both center symmetry changing as well as chiral symmetry changing. The others you are referring to are follow-up. Okay. So Zaitan, uh, do we have the time for more questions? Or yeah, we, we have a question from Joseph, uh, please. Joseph, go ahead. Uh, yeah, some years ago, they used to talk about merons, which are fractions of instantons. Do such configurations play a role in your simulations? Oh. Uh, so of course, uh, so, so not in this case here, but of course uh, you could always uh, argue so that uh, that uh, you want to include all of the important min uh, minimums, and it could be that you missed something, but it could Can also be that. Something? Can I say uh, something? Can I say something? Yes. Merons are just all things that were singular, and actually, what really make plays the role of merons are perfectly regular solutions which are the fractional instantons I was talking about. And actually the first papers in which we used so how to relate all these things, it was written by Van Balen, by me on the lattice, and we showed how to isolate and, and draw this, uh, what you call instanton diodes, okay? And, and we showed how to relate them to the fractional instantons in the other setting. So it's, it's, uh, it's in agreement. As, with, uh, I remember with, for, for, as far as I remember for the fractional instantons, they always come so in fraction of one third or a half. So, so, That's, so right. At least, That's right. So, so and, and, and it's quite important okay. for this uh, description here that you can have any combination. I agree but, completely. I agree completely. Okay. And that's very good. That's because of the one dimensions. As I said uh, ah, okay. yesterday, yeah. one dimension is very special because if you, because it, it, that's the case in which it does not diverge if when you sum. And that allows that the fraction doesn't have to be necessarily one third or one over n. So mm -hmm. that's a special thing of one dimensional arrays, which is what you're using. I think it's, it's nice. It's, it, it's very nice. But they are, the, the, these things are not, I mean, if you want to isolate one, one of those, with one third, you have to put twist. And that's that's shown in this paper with Famba. Okay. So it, we are not talking about different things. We are talking about the same thing, a different mm -hmm. setting. Okay, but yeah. I mean, there's a, a whole problem of names, which is what I was trying to uh, okay. convey, and also Method, I think, is trying to uh, convey. No, 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 I, 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 I know that, but Method has said, said it so many times that at this point here, like, yeah. uh, um, it's not something which you should bring up at every single talk, because that just uh, wastes time, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, okay, but anyway, fine. <laughs> thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> oh, no, thank you yeah. also for the uh, comment. Thanks, Rasmus, for this great talk.